Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is, the, this is God's word. May he add his blessing to it. You can be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which leads us, Lord, and guides us. For your word is true. And we pray, Lord, as we look at this passage, that you would, you would help me, Lord, to bring out the treasure that's in it. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us all to have ears to hear and eyes to see. We ask God that you would bless us as we look at your word. We are committing ourselves to you in this time to you, Lord. We ask for you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what should this church be all about? What should church be all about? I think people often have, they try to describe what their church is like. Our churches were like this. You know, we're kind of more like, you know, we have more of this feeling, more of this vibe. But, but what is the thing that defines it? Is it the singing? Is it the visiting with friends? Is it eating food? I think some of my kids might say that church is really good when there's food involved at the end. Is church about learning about the Bible? What should church look like? You know, some have described the modern church as it's kind of like a Coldplay concert followed by a TED Talk. At least that's in the kind of in the mega churches. Is that what we're going for? You guys should all just say, no. <laughs> some churches are nothing like this, but they have problems in all sorts of other ways. They're bad in many other ways. If you visited around about a year and a half ago when there were churches open, you would find that some churches are basically social clubs. For little old ladies, both male and female. <laughs> others, others have got a serious case of charismania with no real substance. You might uh, walk into a place and, and your eyes would go wide. You'd find some churches crippled with dour legalism and insulated and, and unengaged and you'd walk out the door because of that. You would find many churches completely sold out to old school lame liberalism and others sold out to new school woke liberalism. Is that God's plan for the church? Is that what we're aiming for? No, we're not. But why do things go wrong for churches in so many different ways? And what are we to do to avoid some of that? What are we to do as we plant Redeemer Baptist Church here in the Okanagan? How can we plant ourselves on solid ground? The answer is found in our text today, in the Bible text this morning. And if we look closely at verse 42, we'll see that the answer is the Bible itself. So let's reread Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
here we have a pattern of the early church. Now let's give you some, let's get some context to this. So Acts 2.42, it comes on the heels of Peter's sermon at Pentecost. So a little context to that. Jesus had died about 50 days before Pentecost and rose from, again from the grave. After he rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples uh, for a period of 40 days, visiting them. And after that period of 40 days, he ascended into heaven. And you might remember that story where the, where the apostles are looking up into the sky as Jesus disappears. He goes up and disappears. And then an angel tells them to stop looking up in the sky and get, get going. We also might remember that Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and given power to do ministry. So here the apostles are in Jerusalem after, Pen after the ascension of Jesus, about 10 days later, God comes and fills, fills them with the Holy Spirit. It comes in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit as a dove descending on them, like, uh, like not a dove, sorry, uh, flames of fire, tongues of fire on them. And they're given the gifts of languages, of speaking in tongues, and speaking these languages that everyone around could hear these mighty works of God in their own, in their own language. So there's a whole list of people from all over the world that were in Jerusalem for that Pentecost uh, festival. And here they are witnessing this amazing gift, gift of the Holy Spirit. It's into that scene that Peter stands up and preaches the first Christian sermon, the first sermon of the Christian church. Um, we read a little bit of the end of it. He closes with the call to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so we we might not be speaking in all these same languages and all these things today but what we have is the same Holy Spirit if you've repented and believed and you're added to the church you have the gift of the Holy Spirit he change, changes your life and it's this early church that we see described as they were added that day 3,000 souls and it's that group that devotes themselves to the things that we're talking about today. So here's, here's what we ask. Then what? What do they do after these 3,000 come? Well, that's our text again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Here we see four headings of activity, things that they were doing. What were they all about? Were they... Were they the Coldplay concert with the TED Talk? No. Well, what, what were they doing together? Well, we have four things. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Today, this week, we're going to focus on just the first of those four things, the apostles' teaching. So what's referred to with the apostles' teaching? Well, in the immediate context, it's clear we're talking about the things that Peter was saying and James and John and the other nine. These are the apostles who knew Jesus personally and were commissioned by him to spread the gospel. Later we see it's the pastors and elders of these churches that are then commissioned to continue this teaching. These early Christians were devoting themselves to showing up in person and listening to sermons and listening to teaching. They're going to Bible study. They're asking questions on the way. They were availing themselves of every opportunity to be taught, to be taught by the apostles. So I think we've answered, we answer that question, who is teaching? But what exactly were they teaching? You know, it's just a, a word that could be good or bad, right? Is, is teaching good? Well, it depends on what you're teaching. So what were the apostles teaching? To answer that, I'm just gonna, we're gonna take a short little tour through Acts skipping our way through some references that give us more of what they were teaching about. So first we can just consider right before this, what was Peter just teaching about? Well, it says that he was preaching about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even in back to verse 36, he said, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And before that, he was talking about 
the resurrection of Christ. He's talking about how God attested him through, for, through many works. If you skip ahead in Acts, Acts 4.2, we see that Peter and John, they're described as teaching the people. This is Acts 4, verse 2. They're teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So there's a key theme of their, of their teaching. What is their ministry? What is the note they keep hitting? God raised <coughs> Jesus from the dead. And that was, a, that was a sore point for many of the Jewish leaders of the time. They were teaching people, think about this too, they were teaching people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they're also talking about how can you be raised from the dead? How can you go to heaven? That's what they're talking about. That's the teaching. Or in the words of Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson, how to make it out of planet Earth alive. <laughs> uh, we move on to Acts 5.42. After receiving a beating from the authorities, the apostles did a little jig and continued to teach. They said, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So see that? They're making a proof. They're arguing from the scriptures, from the Old Testament, and they're proving that this Jesus is the anointed one. He's the real Savior. He's, he's the one we were waiting for. So they're, they're arguing and proving that, that Jesus is the Christ. Skipping ahead again, now we come across the Apostle Paul. In Acts 15.35, we hear about Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So he's preaching the word of the Lord, which is most likely a reference to the very things that Jesus was teaching in all of Jesus' gospel ministry. If you read the, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul is reminding them of those things that he had said. What did Paul preach in Corinth? Well, if you look at Acts 18.11, and you don't have to turn there. I'm skipping ahead pretty fast. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So that's the content of the apostles' teaching. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. In Ephesus, we get an even broader picture of the things Paul taught. He says to the Ephesian elders, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot there, but here we see he taught a variety of profitable things in a variety of places to a variety of people. But the message centered around repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He was focused. Later in that same, uh, same section, Paul says his ministry is to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And then he describes his work as going about the people proclaiming the kingdom. Acts 20.25. 20, in 20.27 20, he says... I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And now the last verse of Acts, Acts 28, 31, sums it up. It describes Paul proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Which is a such a wonderful ending to the book of Acts. But what do we see from all that? We see that the teaching was it was actually kind of broad it was as far ranging as the kingdom of God is far ranging and let the reader understand that's pretty far ranging every square inch of this whole cosmos belongs to God and Jesus has a claim on it so, so Paul's preaching and the apostles are preaching and teaching the, the gospel but it's affecting all of life so it's a, it's a broad thing but it's focused it's focused. It really is only about one thing. And more specifically, one person. It's, it's really all about Christ. They're preaching Christ. Every range of topic is connected to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, his work of redemption, 
the message that he proclaimed. So we could say the apostles' teaching was the teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the teaching of the gospel. It was the teaching of the word of God and the kingdom of Christ. That was what the early church was devoted to. They devoted themselves not just to learning for learning's sake, but to learning more about Christ, to learning more about the word of God. Not just any teaching, but the word of God. Now, what does that have to do with us today? That's the early church. So what does that have to do with us today? Well, I'd say everything. It has everything to do with us today. What business do we have starting anything if it's not based on the book? If it's not rooted and built on a solid foundation? I do construction, and one of the, my recent projects was building a fence for my neighbors. And this fence in some ways looked okay. I mean, the panels were, some of them were a little bit broken up. They obviously were leaning a little bit, but generally they were still together. But this fence needed replacing. Do you know why it needed replacing? The foundation was rotten. Most of the posts were poured in a little bit of concrete, but way too low. And dirt and all things were piled on top of it. The foundation was buried and small, and it rotted away the post at the bottom. So everything up top still looked okay, um, except for the little bit of wiggliness, which kind of cued them in to they might need a new fence. Also, another thing that cued them in is the section fell over in the winter, so that, that also helps. <laughs> but the problem was the foundation. The problem was at the bottom. And that was really, I built them a whole new fence, but the main thing I did for them was I gave them another 20, 30 years because I built up the foundation of it and the piles for the posts. Yep. That was the most important part. I could have done the whole job, and if I would have failed that, they would have been in the same problem five years down the road, 10 years down the road. That's why this is important for us to know the same teaching and to devote ourselves to the same teaching because we are, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not reinventing the Christian life. We're not reinventing the church. We're recipients in a long line of this, of this gospel, this teaching, preserved forever in the 66 books of the Bible. We know this gospel because it's written right there. And not only is it written right there, but God has revealed it to us by his Holy Spirit as he's illuminated that scripture to our hearts and given us eyes to see it. So it's the same spirit and the same word that builds this church today. And that builds you as a Christian in your faith. We, like the early church, are called to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Or more broadly, to devote ourselves to the word. To devote ourselves to the word of God. This is really kind of the main, the main point of the message today. Um, just call it point one. Every Christian ought to be devoted to the teaching. The teaching of the word. Every Christian ought to be devoted to the teaching. Just like these, just like these first believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, we need to be devoted to the teaching. Consider how Paul talks about the conversion of the Romans. And so in, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 6, seven, verse 17, he says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to what? To the standard of teaching to which you were committed. You see how that's so integral to Christian life? You don't become a Christian and get converted outside of devotion to the word of God, to the teaching. That's the authority of it. Our, it's tied to it. We've become obedient. We've become committed. We've become devoted to the teaching. If you're a Christian today, you are devoted to the word of God. It's the Christian life. It's part of what it means. Now this, this begs the question, perhaps for some of you, even some of you children, is this your story? Are you devoted to the teaching of God's word? Are you devoted to the Bible? Has God shown you that this really is the words of life, that this is the gospel, that this is good news in here? Has that changed your life? Has the Holy Spirit 
worked through the word of God to give you that conviction? You need to answer that question. And if, and if you haven't, if you can't say that you're devoted to the teaching, I'd encourage you, I would, I would charge you to consider the message again. The message is simple. The message is that God sent his son to be our savior. He sent his son to die on the cross for sinners who are on a highway, a road straight to hell, straight to punishment, that we, we have wrecked our own lives in sin, but he sent his son to redeem us, to buy us back out of that. And, and what does he call us to do? He calls us to repent and believe. Drop those sins like a hot rock, get it out of your hands, turn around, and follow Christ. That's what believing looks like. It just it means, yes, Lord. Stop, stop saying, no, Lord. Don't be like Peter when he said, no, Lord. That, that's an oxymoron. You, can't, you shouldn't put no and Lord together. You need to start saying, yes, Lord. And that's the simple, that's the simple connection, how we, how we come to Christ, is we hear the message, we hear the teaching, and we believe it. We say, this is what I want. I don't want to hold on to my sins anymore. The second point, so first point, every Christian ought to be devoted to the teaching. The second thing, the church must be committed to teaching and preaching this message. So a, a lot of Christians, they have, this is their problem. They're devoted to this teaching, but they find churches out there that aren't, that are not committed to preaching and teaching it. And they feel hungry and thirsty. For the word of God. This is why Redeemer Baptist Church needs to start on this foundation saying, this is the main work of this church. This is what we do. This is our priority. We want to hear from God. We want to devote ourselves to preaching and teaching of God's word. The early church leaders knew that that was their priority. They started having problems because God kept on adding thousands of people to their midst. And they were starting to get swamped with too much, too much, too many things to take care of. And they told them, we have to appoint other men to take care of that because we must, and it says, devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles knew that they needed to stick to the main thing. We see in Paul's letters to Timothy a pattern for pastoral ministry. Paul tells Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And then there's this dramatic command given in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. We have to ask, is there any possible way that Paul could have emphasized that point more strongly? I don't think he could have. He called the angels in. He called everything in to tell you, listen, Timothy, this is what you need to devote yourself to. This is what it's all about. There's no way to be a biblical church and neglect the preaching of the word. And I just want to take this moment to say, I'm committed as the pastor of this church to make this the number one priority of my ministry. That's what I'm aiming to do. That's what I, that's what I will judge my faithfulness on. Have I done my job according to God's word? If I'm to lead you anywhere, I want it to be deeper into God's word. And the gospel. If we're to grow and expand our understanding, let it be an expansion of how we delight and glory in and apply the gospel to all of life. As we apply this, we got to just ask, where do we go from here? So what are some takeaways for each of us today? It is one thing to set up your priorities on paper and describe what ought to be the case. It's another thing entirely to live it out. If we're to be devoted to the word, what is that going to look like? What should we do? Well, like I was just saying, there's a major point of application for teachers, for elders, pastors. It's to devote themselves 
to the teaching and preaching of the Bible. So like the apostles, they weren't going to just pursue a million other activities. They were going to keep focused on doing, on doing the main thing. They were going to delegate other things so that they could preach the gospel. Think of what uh, Paul says in Corinthians. He says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the message of the gospel, it's enough. It's sufficient. We don't need to wander into all sorts of other things we can wander into. Become expert psychologists and expert cultural um, you know, aficionados or whatever the word would be. We don't, need to, we don't need to know everything that we need to know in the world. We need to know the word. We need to keep teaching and preaching the word. So you guys know how to hold me accountable. Uh, let me turn the tables a little bit. What are you commanded to do according to the scripture? Well, this is a simple one. Do what you're doing right now. Listen to the sermon on Sunday. I know that we often talk about we don't want to be a Sunday Christian, right? Don't be a Sunday Christian. But what we, what we really mean when we say that is don't merely be a Sunday Christian. You definitely should be a Sunday Christian, okay? You definitely should come to hear from God on the Lord's day. That should be the rhythm of your life. That's, that's what God has set up for us for our own good. Just, just in the same way that he created the, the world in six days and then rested, He's, he's flipped that in the new covenant where we start the week with resting in God's word and prioritizing God's word as the foundation. And from there, we live out our whole week. And then we get to do it again. We get to do it again. And every week we get reoriented to where we ought to be. That's what church should do for you. It doesn't mean that you're not being more than a Sunday Christian and that you, have, you read the word and other things during the week. But you need to have that pattern of that weekly coming before the Lord to worship Him, to hear His Word, to listen, to listen and to hear what God would have to say to you. At the most basic, a Christian is simply someone who believes the gospel message. So there's someone who, they're going to continue to listen and believe that message. They want to hear it again. This is what makes them a Christian. So as we as we come week by week, we're continuing in that same faith. We're standing fast in it. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. We need to, we need to put ourselves in earshot of the gospel. So come, eager to listen, to learn, and to grow in your faith. A second application would be this. Read and study your own Bible. That's a good way to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Read some things that the apostle Peter wrote, the apostle John, or the Old Testament, everything. Read the Bible. That's a way that the whole church, if the whole church does that, it sounds individualistic, but really we're all members who influence and impact each other. And the ministry of the church is, is, not, is not only or mainly from from the pastor to the congregation, but it's it's from every member of the body to one another. So do you want to have a message for your neighbor? Do you want to have a message for your friend? Do you want to have the, the encouragement or the exhortation from God's word? You need to know the Bible as well. You need to devote yourself to studying it. As you do that, morning by morning or evening by evening, you're building your life on God's word one day at a time. So come to Sunday, you're building your life one week at a time. Read your Bible every day, you're building it one day at a time. Another thing, third point, listen and engage with other studies with the church throughout the week. So Sunday is important, but there will be other opportunities as time goes on to have men's groups, to have Bible studies. These are ways that God can continue to drill down in teaching us his word. These are further ways that we can show to God we are devoted to your teaching I'm listening God to your word I want to hear from you I want to grow and the last one I'll, I'll have here is read and listen to sound biblical teaching from books podcasts and recorded sermons there's I put that last because I do believe that would be less important than your own Bible reading than coming to church and all these things 
But it's, it's not that it has no help to you. It is a helpful thing. I praise the Lord for good books, for good brothers who have recorded their things. And you can listen to things that you've heard back in the past and re-listen to them. And God can continue to shape you by his word. So avail yourselves of that as well. As we conclude, though, I want us to look one more time at the Apostle Paul's words. Once again, we're reminded of what he devoted himself to. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 2. If you have your Bible, it would be good to turn to bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll start at verse 1. And consider the language. He's telling them to keep listening. He's telling them to keep um, to be reminded of his preaching. But listen to the language here. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. Notice that he's not telling them a bunch of new things. He's reminding them which you received. That's part of what it means to become a Christian. In which you stand. And by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Consider that. God doesn't call you just to receive the word of God one time and to say, I heard that message, I believe it. He calls you to stand in it, to hold fast to it, to, to remain, to remain firmly planted in the word of God. He even says, by which you're being saved. We are saved up at a moment of time or where we're justified but there's this that that moment of time has implications and God's slowly bringing us in a journey of sanctification he's saving us from from more sins he's he's guarding us and guiding us to the end so you can say that as you as you come to church as you listen as you read your bible you are you are being saved still by the word of God he's still in the process of bringing you to where you where you ought to be. And one day it'll be finished, it'll be glorified. But, but God's work in your life is all through the Christian life. And let's just remind ourselves once again of what that basic message is. Verse 3. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's simple. That's simple gospel. This is simple church. This is the simple Christian life. It's just what we've learned in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Next week we'll talk more about the other things that they're also devoted to, the things that flesh out the Christian life. But for this week, is important as the first week to build the foundation. And I, I pray that the Lord um, continues to build each of you up in your faith. Let's, let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your word, and we do want to build our lives upon it. We thank you, God, that we have this example of the apostles, we have the example of the early church, and Lord, we pray that you would focus us and keep us firmly planted on the main thing. Help us, Lord, not to ever wander away. Help us, Lord, to stay firmly planted, to stand in you. Lord, would you, would you keep us by your grace? In Jesus' name.